Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Emily and I'm the regional coordinator of the local greater Phoenix region over here in Arizona. We've got several people from around the country today joining us, so we're so glad to have you. And we're going to turn it over to Dr. Holly Welker, who is one of our board members. Um, and she's the one who typically leads our book discussions. So for those of you who have not met Holly, I'm going to hand it all over to her. Um, I just dropped your book. Um, I suggested um, that we read and discuss A Room of One's Own because it is Austin adjacent. Um, most people who join JASNA um, are familiar with Austin's novels. So if we're gonna read something, seems like we should read something that expands our understanding of Austin's work instead of reading Austin's work. Um, and there are, a, at least two different ways to discuss this book. One is uh, on its own merits in terms of the argument that Wolf is making about um, the need women have to have some privacy and a livable income in order to write. And the other is in terms of what it says about Austin. Um, and I will admit it's been Oh, 15 years or so since the last time I read this. And I had forgotten just how much she talks about Austin. She has a, a lot to say. So I would like to facilitate discussion and start by asking all of you what you want to say about this book and its assessment of Austin's work. Well, I'll, since I only read the spark notes, I mean, I, I really, <laughs> not really prepared to engage it, but I wanted to come and join the Zoom meeting just to hear what you had to say about it, because it's all very interesting. Well, I'll jump in and start a little bit. What I was kind of shocked about is um, how much Virginia Woolf mentions a lot of different uh Authors throughout, she mentions, of course, Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, Emily Bronte, um, no name of Anne Bronte, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fanny Burney, you know, George Eliot, just mentions a whole lot of them, um, but almost makes a point, and I forget which chapter it was in, maybe in chapter four, or chapter five of the essay, where basically, to me, <laughs> it, she was basically kind of saying that Jane Austen and Emily Bronte were the only two uh, female authors who were kind of truly able to write without biases um, right. a little bit, which I really thought kind of fascinating. Um, right. She talks, she, uh, um, she says that Austin, Jane Austen and Shakespeare were the only writers whose minds consumed every impediment and became incandescent so that you really couldn't see the writer, you could only see their work. Um, and I saw another, somebody else made the comment that they didn't read the book. <laughs> so if, if that's the case, then, then I probably should provide a brief introduction. So I will go ahead and do that. And um, A Room of One's Own was published in 1929. It is a revision of two presentations that Wolf made at women's colleges in Oxford, uh, though she refers to it in the book as Oxbridge. I think that's right. I think it was just Oxford and not Oxford and Cambridge, um, on the topic of women and fiction. And her basic argument is that a woman must have a room of her own and 500 pounds a year in order to write fiction. 500 pounds a year. Uh, my edition was published in 2005. They say that it would come out to about $37,000. Um, we might say at this point that uh, it would be about $40,000 a year plus health care. The point being that you cannot write fiction if you are exhausted and poor, that, that writing requires a certain amount of leisure. 
um, she does something extremely famous that this, this is one of the most famous things in the book. And I'm just going to go ahead and read it because um, it is, it is, it sums up her argument pretty well. Um, <laughs> she talks, she talks about, first of all, some guy saying that um, women could not write, where'd it go? Here it is. Um, what I find deplorable, I continued looking about the bookshelves again, is that nothing is known about women before the 18th century. I have no model in my mind to turn about this way and that. Here am, am I asking why women did not write poetry in the Elizabethan age, and I am not sure how they were educated, whether they were taught to write, whether they had sitting rooms to themselves, how many women had children before they were 21, what, in short, they did from eight in the morning till eight at night. They had no money, evidently. According to Professor Trevelyan, they were, like, they were married, whether they liked it or not, before they were out of the nursery at 15 or 16, very likely. It would have been extremely odd, even upon this showing, had one of them suddenly written the plays of Shakespeare, I concluded. And I thought of that old gentleman who is dead now, but was a bishop, I think, who declared that it was impossible for any woman past, present, or to come to have the genius of Shakespeare. He wrote to the papers about it. He also told a lady who applied to him for information that cats do not, as a matter of fact, go to heaven, though they have, he added, souls of a sort. How much thinking those old gentlemen used to save one. How the borders of ignorance shrank back at their approach. Cats do not go to heaven. Women cannot write the plays of Shakespeare. Um, and I, I think that's really funny. It's actually um, the first description I have seen of mansplaining. Um, anyway, um, and then she goes on and she, is very famous for the character she creates in this next section. Be that as it may, I could not help thinking as I looked at the works of Shakespeare on the shelf that the bishop was right in this, at least. It would have been impossible completely and entirely for any woman to have written the plays of Shakespeare in the age of Shakespeare. Let me imagine, since facts are so hard to come by, what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith, let us say. Shakespeare himself went, very probably, his mother was an heiress, to the grammar school where he may have learned Latin, Ovid, Virgil, and Horace, and the elements of grammar and logic. He was, it is well known, a wild boy who poached rabbits, perhaps shot a deer, and had, rather sooner than he should have done, to marry a woman in the neighborhood who bore him a child rather quicker than was right. That escapade sent him to seek his fortune in London. He had, it seemed, a taste for the theater. He began by holding horses at the stage door. Very soon he got work in the theater, became a successful actor, and lived at the hub of the universe, meeting everybody, knowing everybody, practicing his art on the boards, exercising his wits in the street, and even getting access to the palace of the queen. Meanwhile, his extraordinarily gifted sister, let us suppose, remained at home. She was as adventurous, as imaginative, as agog to see the world as he was, but she was not sent to school. She had no chance of learning grammar and logic, let alone reading Horace and Virgil. She picked up a book now and then, one of her brothers perhaps, and read a few pages. But then her parents came in and told her to mend the stockings or mind the stew and not moon about with books and papers. They would have spoken sharply but kindly, for they were substantial people who knew the conditions of life for a woman and loved their daughter. Indeed, more likely than not, she was the apple of her father's eye. Perhaps she scribbled some pages up in an apple loft on the sly, but was careful to hide them or set fire to them. Soon, however, before she was out of her teens, she was betrothed to the son of a neighboring wool stapler. She cried out that marriage was hateful to her, and for that she was severely beaten by her father. Then he ceased to scold her. He begged her instead not to hurt him, not to shame him in this matter of her marriage. He would give her a chain of beads or a fine petticoat, he said, and there were tears in his eyes. How could she disobey him? How could she break his heart? 
The force of her own gift alone drove her to it. She made up a small parcel of her belongings, let herself down by a rope one summer's night, and took the road to London. She was not 17. The birds that sang in the hedge were not more musical than she was. She had the quickest fancy, a gift like her brother's, for the tune of words. Like him, she had a taste for the theater. She stood at the stage door. She wanted to act, she said. Men laughed in her face. The manager, a fat, loose-lipped man, guffawed. He bellowed something about poodles dancing and women acting. No woman, he said, could possibly be an actress. He hinted, you can imagine what. She could get no training in her craft. Could she even seek her dinner in a tavern or roam the streets at night? Yet her genius was for fiction and lusted to feed abundantly upon the lives of men and women and the study of their ways. At last, for she was very young, oddly like Shakespeare the poet in her face with the same gray eyes and rounded brows, at last Nick Green the actor, manager, took pity on her. She found herself with child by that gentleman and so, who shall measure the heat and violence of the poet's heart when caught and tangled in a woman's body? killed herself one winter's night and lies buried at some crossroads where the omnibuses now stop outside the elephant and castle. So, um, <laughs> and the point being, I guess I'll read this next little bit since it, that more or less is the how the story would run, I think, if a woman in Shakespeare's day had Shakespeare's genius. But for my part, I agree with the deceased bishop, if such he was, it is unthinkable that any woman in Shakespeare's day should have had Shakespeare's genius. For genius like Shakespeare's is not born among the laboring, uneducated, servile people. It was not born in England among the Saxons and the British, Britons. It is not born today among the working class. Um, now and again, Yet a genius of sort must have existed among women as it existed among the working classes. Now and again, an Emily Bronte or a Robert Burns blazes out and proves its presence, but certainly it never got itself on paper. When, however, one reads of a witch being ducked, of a woman possessed by devils, of a wise woman selling herbs, or even a very remarkable man who had a mother, then I think we are on the track of a lost novelist, a suppressed poet, or some mute and inglorious Jane Austen, some Emily Bronte who dashed her brains out on the moors, or moped and mowed about the highways, crazed with the torture that her gift had put her to. Indeed, I would venture to say that Anon, or Anonymous, who wrote so many poems without signing them, was often a woman. Um, so the point being, it's, it's really hard to write if you have no money, no privacy, and no education. And yet, Jane Austen did it. Um, and Wolf talks extensively about um, the way Jane Austen just kind of thumbed her nose at everybody and just went ahead and wrote what she wanted to. Um, she wrote her novels sitting in the drawing room uh, when the family was around so that she could cover her novels up, cover her work up. Um, and um, is a genius. Um, is one of is one of the great geniuses um, here was a woman writing about this is about Austin here was a woman writing about the year 1800 writing without hate without bitterness without fear without protest without preaching that was how Shakespeare wrote, I thought, looking at Anthony and Cleopatra. And when women compare Shakespeare and Jane Austen, they may mean that the minds of both had consumed all impediments. And for that reason, we do not know Jane Austen and we do not know Shakespeare. And for that reason, Jane Austen pervades every word she wrote and so does Shakespeare. If Jane Austen suffered in any way from her circumstances, it was in the narrowness of life. I just, are you, can you still hear me? Okay, I just I just heard a scary beat. Sorry. I think <laughs> somebody fine. else just came on. Okay, that's, that's fine. I just wondered like if my um if Jane Austen suffered in any way from the circumstances it was in the narrowness of life that was imposed upon her. It was impossible for a woman to go about alone. She never traveled, she never drove through London in an omnibus or had luncheon in a shop by herself. 
but perhaps it was not the nature of Jane Austen not to want what she had not. Her gift and her circumstances matched each other completely. So does that prompt anybody to have anything to say or to pose a question? Um, didn't didn't she say something about um, Jane using a blotter or something to cover yeah. up her words? Yes, yeah. that that uh, um, when someone came into the room, she would cover up what she was writing so that she wouldn't have to deal with questions about it. That that surprised me because I thought she shared all her writing with her family. Uh, she she shared she shared all the finished products. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, but, you know. And that that might be a myth. It, we get that story from her her nephew. And I, I, you have to take him with a pound of salt. He, he means well. And, you know, thank goodness he wrote the bio. But there are things in there. Uh, no, she, she, she'd laugh that you wrote that, that. That she was so sweet and so innocent. Yeah, I, I almost think that... Um, that Wolf is going to the other extreme. We, we do know that Austin spent time in London because she was waiting for the publishing of the books and she did travel at least a little bit. I mean, not to the extent that she should have, of course, <laughs> you know, had she been given more opportunity, but she did travel a little bit. So it's not that she spent yeah. every single moment in Hampshire and in Sweden. And sorry, the, the cat is rubbing <laughs> rubbing against the iPad, but. Uh... Yeah, I mean, certainly she never left England. Yeah. Um, um, and, and in um, an essay about Austin in The Common Reader, um, Wolf quotes some people who knew Austin who said that as a girl, she was the prettiest, silliest, most affected husband hunting butterfly she ever remembers and there then there was somebody else who said that she was actually really mean um uh she is still a poker but a poker of whom everybody is afraid a wit a delineator of character who does not talk is terrific indeed um so yeah we yeah we what we know of austin um from her family is is highly skewed. This is in uh, chapter four, I think, where you, where you found the uh, hide the manuscripts or covered them with the blotting paper yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny that uh, that uh, Wolf says that Austin should lay a, a, a wreath at the, the the head of Bernie because uh, I, I read I, I read Isn't it Bernie. After Bing? What sorry. Isn't it Afra Bain? Uh, Jane Austen should have laid a wreath upon the, the grave of Fanny Burney. Okay. And then Fanny uh, Burney. Al also that. chapter four, I'm not sure where. I, I'm, I'm looking at a, at a, you know, online. So I don't have a page, sorry. But but, but the, the, the fact is that it matter if you've read Burney, at least in my opinion, for instance, Evelina, yeah. Austen took what Burney did and went, so much further. Bernie oh, has a absolutely. joke. Yeah. Bernie has a 40 page joke in Evelina. It's not funny. Yeah, yeah. No, I I read it. Yeah. I read it. It was um yeah. But that's about the fact that um Fanny Bernie publishing her work made it that much easier for Austin to pu publish hers. Not that she necessarily influenced Austin in any particular way. Austin was a much better writer. Um, yeah. Um, yes. She does mention Afra Bain. Afra Bain, you, um, it's spelled A-P-H-R-A-B-E-H-N. She is the first woman um, that Wolf knows of who uh, made a living by writing. Um, she, she she's, was she's um, meant, a loose she's, woman and a spy. So she's, she's mentioned in my book, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, for Beth. <laughs> but she was successful and she did make enough money to live on. I don't know how yeah. much she made, but um, yeah. her place did well. Mm -hmm. 
but she didn't write novels or poetry. She just wrote plays, which were very popular. She wrote with some poetry. She wrote mm -hmm. one, uh, oh crap, I was going to look it up. She actually wrote a poem about, um, about impotence, about a shepherd and shepherdess who are going to have sex, but the guy can't get it up. And um, it's actually <laughs> a pretty funny poem. Um, but I, I, that was on my to-do list to look the title of that poem up and find it, but I, I forgot. Um, I can do it later. So, wow. I did kind of find it interesting and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, on, everyone's thoughts on this, but kind of as I was reading through the essay, I almost got the feeling that, um, and she never straight out said it, but that Virginia Woolf almost reveres poets more than novelists. Um, in a lot of ways. It seems like she thinks that to be a poet is, I don't know, um, takes more skill than to be a novelist. There has certainly been a hierarchy of l literary merit. Um, and poetry was definitely at the top. Um, uh, it, it uh, also a poet's sensibilities. Um, poets were thought to be, have, have a finer spirit, um, to be more, more emotional and deeper. Um, the Austin herself goes there a little bit. Um, it's in persuasion. Uh, Anne Elliot is talking to the, oh, I can't remember his name, the character's name. Um, he's engaged to someone and then she dies. And oh, Captain Bennett. Captain yeah. Bennett, yeah. Yes, that's, yes. And, uh, um, um, and all he does is read poetry. And, and she's, she's like, I think you need to read more prose. And then Captain Benig and whichever one of the um, sisters that everybody thinks um, Captain Wentworth is going to get engaged to. Louisa. And the one who, what? Louisa. 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 Yes. Uh, when Captain Benig and Louisa get engaged and everybody is so shocked, um, Austin writes, of course they fell in love over poetry. So uh, novels were considered less literary, um, partly because women wrote them. Um, um, you didn't have to be prose. Prose just was not considered as refined as poetry. And the fact that women wrote novels made them a disreputable uh, genre for a very long time. Um, and even for that matter, you could see something similar happening today. Uh, the fact that so many women write memoir makes it a somewhat disreputable genre. Um, and now fiction is considered much, a much serious long mm. novels written by men by the likes of Jonathan Franzen and um, uh, David Foster Wallace. So, so yeah, yeah, that's, there's, there's a snobbery about poetry. Yeah. And I guess yeah. what I was so interested is I knew that there was definitely a snobbery around Jane Austen's kind because the novel was so new, hence why it yeah. was called the novel. Um, right. <laughs> but I was kind of fascinated that still in 19, what, 28, 29, when Virginia yeah. gave this, yeah. um, yeah. these speeches like that, it was still considered even a hundred plus years later, yes. still, you know, that difference of how people thought about it. Well, you know, it's it's still sort of it. I mean, if you go to someplace like the Iowa Writers Workshop, um, poets are <laughs> poets are um, occupy a, a different intellectual and emotional space than fiction writers. But nobody um, reads poetry. <laughs> <laughs> 
not it is true it is it is a less important genre that is yeah. absolutely true uh, yeah. people may think it's sophisticated or whatever word you want to use but it doesn't sell that's for sure that that is that is absolutely true that and is. yet uh the last american to win the nobel prize was louise gluck for her poetry fascinating yeah. i i continued on in chapter uh, four just looking at this um we're talking about sentences and then mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. just uh, i i can't read it's too long and i I'm having a little respiratory issue, but but the way she talks about how what Austin did with the sentence, I think, is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And I, I don't I don't come to Austin for sentence structure. I, you know, I, I come for the sorry, I come from the romance. But but the, the <laughs> sentence structure has, has has invested itself with me. And when I read things like Bernie, for example, where where they they go on too long and too off the point, you know, I, I go. Yeah. Where's the plot? Where's yeah. the plot? Yeah. Austin has the plot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have it right here if you want yeah. me to read Please it real read. quick. Yeah. So, yeah. No one wants to hear yeah. me read. <laughs> <laughs> so all the great novelists like Thackeray and Dickens and Balzac have written a natural prose, swift but not slovenly, expressive but not precious, taking their own tints without ceasing to be common property. They have based it on the sentence that was current at that time. The sentence that was current at the beginning of the 19th century ran something like this, perhaps, quotes, the grandeur of their works was an argument with them not to stop short, but to proceed. They could have no higher excitement or satisfaction that in the exercise of their art and endless generations of truth and beauty, success prompts to exertion and habit facilitates success, end quote. That is a man sentence. Behind it, one can see Johnson, Gibbon, and the rest. It was a sentence that was unsuited for a woman's use. Charlotte Bronte, with all her splendid gift for prose, stumbled and fell with that clumsy weapon in her hands. George Eliot committed atrocities with, that, with it, that beggar description. Jane Austen looked at it and laughed at it and devised a perfectly natural, shapely sentence proper for her own use and never departed from it. Thus, with less genius for writing than Charlotte Bronte, she got infinitely more said. Hmm. Hmm. In, in this essay I mentioned in The Common Reader about Jane Austen, she also, Wolf also talks about Austen laughing at people. Um, that, you know, when she is, she is 15, um, it is the sound of laughter. The girl of 15 is laughing in her corner at the world. Um, and that somehow Jane Austen just was born with an insight into pe people. When she, um, at 15, she had few illusions about other people and none about herself. Whatever she writes is finished and turned and set in its relation, not to the parsonage, but to the universe. She is impersonal, she is inscrutable. Jane Austen kept to her compact. She never trespassed beyond her boundaries. Never, even at the emotional age of 15, did she round upon herself in shame, obliterate a sarcasm in a spasm of compassion, or blur an outline in a mist of rhapsody. The point being, she, she talks about Austen's artistic integrity, that um, she always did what the work needed. Um, and I, I mean, in it's hard to quibble with her assessment since it has held her work has held up so very, very well. Um, there, there just is no one comparable from her time period who is as widely read. Um, and you know, there are some other really great novels. Um, uh, uh, Tom Jones is a is a great novel. Uh, by um, Henry Fielding, but it's long and at times silly in ways Austen isn't. Um, uh, despite the fact that she deals with, you know, something people think is trivial, like, you know, finding a husband, um, 
finding a spouse, um, it's still really important to people. And her ideas about the necessity of a decent income when getting married is borne out today by the fact that um, people wait to marry and people, people will just be engaged or live together for decades and they get married later in life when they finally have the money to do it. Or they have a child, whichever comes first. No, actually, yeah. that's that's not the case. Not the um, case. People, people, that's, that's why we have terms like baby mama and baby daddy. People, women are willing to have children with men they are not willing to marry. Okay, I just would like to read okay. you a couple of sentences from uh, Virginia Woolf's article that she wrote to the newspaper. Okay. It's called Jane Austen at 60 is the name of the article. Anybody who has had the temerity to write about Jane Austen is aware of two facts. First, that of all the great writers, she is the most difficult to catch in the act of greatness. Second, that there are 25 elderly gentlemen living in the neighborhood of London who resent any slight upon her genius as if it were an insult offered to the chastity of their aunts. <laughs> love, love that. I was, wasn't sure if it was in this or something else. So I appreciate you, you pointing that out. Um, I had the displeasure recently in, a, in a, one of my other, in an Austin group where they all, all, everyone but myself attacked Emma. And so I felt like I was the only one defending her. I felt like one of those 25 and as I age, I become more and more like those 25 gentlemen, as a matter of fact. Back Emma. Good grief. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it is interesting, too, because throughout A Room of One's Own, the only two novels of Jane Austen's that Virginia Woolf even brings up is Pride and Prejudice and Emma. She doesn't touch <laughs> any of the others. Yeah. You know, yeah. so when she's speaking of works of genius, those yeah. are the two that you yeah. can very obviously feel that Virginia Woolf thinks is Jane Austen's best yeah. works. Yeah. yeah. She um um in this little essay I keep quoting from, she discusses persuasion and the Watsons. But I, there are moments when I think, did she read Northanger Abbey? Did she read the section where where Austin goes off on you know <laughs> not we are an injured body blah 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 she she lets herself get very angry there um perhaps perhaps Wolf reads it differently because it is it's it's so meta it's mm. about the the work she is writing instead of about um, any particular deeply personal grievance um the way charlotte bronte mm -hmm. does the the thing is she she quotes this long passage from jane Eyre, where mm -hmm. jane Eyre is saying i'd never get to go any place i'm stuck here in this you know big old lonely house and i oh. am an orphan and blah 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 and nobody in austin's work says anything comparable yeah. the closest thing is that um little diatribe in um Northanger Abbey, which is honestly one of my favorite things Austin wrote. Yeah. Um, I actually have that the end of that quote that you were talking about where she goes off on what uh, yeah. in Jane Eyre, how yeah. Jane Eyre is just like, I hate the world and the, yeah. the way women are in. And then she goes on um, to speak about Charlotte Bronte. And I just thought this was interesting because she does compare it a little bit later to Emma. Um, in those words, she puts her finger exactly not only upon her own defects as a novelist, but upon <laughs> those of her sex at that time. She knew no one better how enormously her genius would have profited if it had not spent itself in solitary visions over distant fields, if experience and intercourse and travel had been granted her. But they were not granted, they were withheld. And we must accept the fact that all those good novels, Villette, Emma, Wuthering Heights, Middlemarch, were written by women without more experience of life than could enter the house of a respectable clergyman, written to in the common sitting room of that respectable house and by women so poor that they could not afford to buy more than a few quires of paper at a time upon which to write Wuthering Heights or Jane Eyre. Virginia Woolf has a way with words. <laughs> yes, yes, she does. She, uh, and yeah, 
she she really does um she's she's considered one of the great stylists um of of the early 20th century yeah a, a, a modernist genius yeah quite interesting to look at from like a feminist piece as well um, yeah yeah because she really yeah, goes yeah. into a lot of that as well too like yeah. I don't know how much feminist writing was done before I mean obviously we know Wollstonecraft and stuff like that but like right. she hits it pretty heavy on the head throughout it oh yeah so. and and she discusses patriarchy like she refers to 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 patriarchy yes she was definitely considered a feminist um uh I, I did grab some of my, I, not all of them. Um, so this is her first novel. These are my very old editions from the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, their favorite wolf novel is To the Lighthouse. It is not mine. Um, it's about an English family waiting, waiting to see what the weather's going to be like. Um, a lot more people love Mrs. Dalloway. It's about, um, I think, if, uh, I think she's 50, Clarissa Dalloway. She's either, either 50 or 60. She's having a party. Um, it's written right after World War I. Um, and then my favorite Wolf novel is Orlando, um, which starts with a male character in the 16th century who um, at the beginning of the 20th century is a woman and only about 35 years old. So um, somebody who lives forever and just has a spontaneous uh, sex change. It's, it's, actu it's actually, I, I, uh, uh, there's a movie that was made of it that's starring mm -hmm. Tilda Swinton. Um, it was okay. I liked that better than the Mrs. Dalloway movie. Um, and, and Virginia Woolf um, had, had an interesting, her, her father was famous. Um, uh, she was orphaned as a teenager and molested by her uh, half brothers and um, always, always, always resented her entire life that she was not educated. Her brothers were sent to college and um, there, it just really, it really, really bummed her out that she had very little formal education, as is obvious in, in a room of one's own. Yeah, you can really see that through the chapter where she goes to the luncheon and has this great meal and then later on in the evening goes to dinner in the yeah. women's college and yeah. is barely fed anything edible and then yeah. goes up to one of her friend's rooms and it's sparse and, yeah. and goes on a whole diatribe about you know yeah. if you know your mother's mother's mother would have right. you know been able to donate their money to this college and so right. yeah yeah mm. Why is the lighthouse your favorite, Holly? Oh no, to the lighthouse is not my favorite. Oh, which I, was I, the one? You said Orlando. Well, I've read that one, and I've read Mrs. Dalloway. What was the one that you said was your favorite? Orlando. I think that's the, yeah, I have not read Orlando. I I admit it's been a very long time since I read. I read this as an undergrad. Um, it's been almost forty years since I read it. Um. I, it, I, it was funny and interesting and the prose was beautiful. Um, I really need to reread it. Um, I can't say much, you know, I don't know, just um, like she includes photographs that are actually of her lover, Vita Sackville West. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's just very inventive. I had never read anything like it. So. Mm -hmm. Just curious. And um, I will tell you that um, 
Austin, uh, that Wolf's argument about Shakespeare's sister was taken by Alice Walker, who wrote The Color Purple. Um, and in an essay called In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, she talks about um, Wolf's claim that, you know, that any woman who had genius would have gone crazy or um, blown her brains out. Um, and let's see. Well, if you will excuse me all, I have to leave. Okay. Have somewhere to be. Thank you very much. I enjoyed Thank this. You. I enjoyed seeing everybody and hope yeah, some of you will make it up to the box hill. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Bye, Carol. Um, anyway, she talks about the fact that um, that uh, if if women who were working, women poor, very poor women couldn't um, couldn't become artists, what, what would it mean to be a slave? Um, where did it go? Oh, well, I can't, I can't, sorry. Um, I must have lost my place marker. Yeah, sorry. And um, it, anyway, it's uh, I can maybe find a copy of it online and 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 uh, provide a link or something. And um, it is a really interesting commentary, um, uh, in terms of of the very few outlets Black women had for creativity. She talks about quilt making. She talks about gardening, um, and what it would mean to be to have an artist temperament when you know. You didn't even own yourself. But isn't that still true today that if you have no resources and no money, I mean, maybe you've got more education today because now everybody has a minimum level of education. But still, if you're, uh, you know, a working class person, and this, I guess, would go for men, too, you know, you don't have really much room in your life yeah. for any artistic yeah. endeavors so i yes. don't think that's changed at all with Absolutely. the exception of some you know autobiographies of my terrible life growing up or my life in prison or whatever it seems like it, that's makes it very very difficult so yes. in a way yes that's no different than it was then it was more true for women then perhaps now it's true for anybody who's yeah. you know not a relatively privileged person right Yes, yes, that, that is why um, uh, this book is still read and is still considered relevant almost a mm -hmm. hundred years after it was published. It's absolutely true that um, poverty makes it hard to produce art. Art does not pay very well until you are famous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which makes it all the more remarkable that Jane Austen got it done. Just <laughs> to bring it back to why we're here. Uh, and she, she was not wealthy. Um, uh, her, her circumstances became more and more reduced the older she got. And she still managed to produce these just breathtakingly complicated, innovative works. Yes, but she, this is Martha Lang speaking. She had a support system. She had Cassandra, her sister, her father's encouragement. She had a relatively stable uh, home life until they were uh, thrown out of uh, Bath. Yeah. Um, but she, she had a tenacious disposition she had she was gifted certainly but she really made up her mind to be a writer and she had a gift for conversations mm -hmm. and I'm actually mm -hmm. writing a play about 
how Jane Austen was able to do what she did. And um, extraordinary. It was just a, a perfect uh, combination. And may I say my favorite quote from Virginia Woolf is, the joy and the sorrow interwoven, interwoven like reeds in the moonlight. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. I love the, the line about uh, catching her in the act of greatness. Uh, John Mullen's great book, uh, 20 Questions Answered, has a chapter. Okay, let's, let's find some. And, you know, he points to Emma and the indirect free discourse, right. whatever, how, how it's pronounced. Okay, that, that's sort of greatness right here. <laughs> I mean, there, there may be a Virginia Woolf association a right? of, well, I, I just was gonna, was there may be a Virginia Woolf Association of North America. I have not bothered to, to look for it um, or join it. Um, it's, it's still, people have so much to say about Austin. Um, and while I, I think Virginia Woolf is really important, um, I, I, I'm just not sure, <laughs> I'm just not sure she's going to age as well as, uh, uh, Austin has. Not that it's necessarily a contest, but um, it's still really interesting. Anyway, I was competing with somebody there for a minute. So whoever it was, please, I'll be quiet now. No? Yes, not. Um, I did want to bring back to something you said that, you know, in a hundred years time, you know, that we're still reading her work. Yeah. Um, and I thought it very interesting. I think it was end of chapter five. I wrote the quote down, but I think I think it was up toward the end of chapter five. She's reading the more modern book from mm -hmm. the, whatever fictional female right. author she's talking about. And she's saying, give her another hundred years. I concluded reading the last chapter, give her a room of her own and 500 a year, let her speak her mind and leave out half that she now puts in. And she will write a better book. One of these days, she will be a poet in another hundred years time. And I think it's sad because as we just said, a yeah. hundred years later, we're still where we were pretty much. Yeah. I mean, obviously things have gotten a little bit better <laughs> since 1928 in some ways, but in many others, no, we have not. Well, certainly, um, uh, women women do write and publish more novels. Women have won um, the Nobel Prize, um, uh, but but yeah, um, women works by women are still read less often than works by men. Works about women about girls are read less than works about boys. That's, you know, why J.K. Rowling made her uh, main character Harry Potter and not Hermione Potter. Yeah. Um. <sighs> yeah, add one thing that uh, we haven't mentioned Charles Dickens. He was, he preceded uh, Jane Austen. No. And, um, he certainly was a great writer. No, Dickens. Dickens <laughs> was a Victorian. Dickens. Uh, Dickens. He he was. After Austin Jane? was Dickens' predecessor. Okay, Dickens sorry about born, that. Dickens was born in eighteen twelve, and okay. uh, um, Austin died, died in, in um, 18, 15, eighteen seventeen. 17. So, yeah. Okay, my mistake. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dickens, yes, Dickens is a great writer. He's um, uh, um, considered a master of the novel, but but he inherited the innovations Austin had made to the form. Oh, okay. The other thing I just wanted to mention very briefly, and I don't want to uh, talk too much, is uh, Emily Dickinson in uh, the States. She certainly had a genius for poetry, and her life was you know, something restricted the same as Jane Austen. And there again, she had uh, her sister, Vanessa. 
Vivian helping her with a, a strong yeah. family structure. Yeah. Emily Dickinson should, you know, be considered among the great poets. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. Uh, Though I don't, um, uh, Virginia Woolf as a British snob probably did not read much Whitman <laughs> and Dickens, Dickinson. And <laughs> um, uh, I will say that both Jane Austen and Emily Dickinson were Sagittarius's. Um, they were uh, uh, childless, and um, that's that's something else Virginia Woolf mentions about um, the Brontes, uh, George Eliot, and Austen. That that none of them had any children. Um, Dorothy Austen Wordsworth, and, Dorothy Wordsworth William Wordsworth's sister, was an amazing writer. She, she, in many ways, was as gifted as William Wordsworth. She was a contemporary of Jane Austen. But yeah. anyway, so it was tough and it still is hard. Yeah. If it was easy, we'd all do it. Right. <laughs> it seems like everybody is doing it now, though, with self publishing and things like that. It's so much easier to get your voice heard. Yeah, well, yeah, then. but self publishing, I mean, most people who self publish a book sell dozens of copies and um i actually used to um write reviews of self-published books um as a way to make a little extra money and most most of them are just most of them are just so appallingly bad um mm -hmm. uh i mean in in the same way that publishers act as gatekeepers they also act as quality control um, uh -huh. um it's true. Professional copy editing, professional typesetting. Yeah. And and there are even people, there's um oh I can't uh, a a poet who started publishing pictures of her poems on Instagram. Um and she got a pretty lucrative um publishing deal out of out of that i can't remember her name i think she, i think she's indian I, I i don't remember um but you've probably encountered her poems your your friends have probably posted them on social media um there there are always exceptions that's that's why there's a saying the exception proves the rule um something's true for for most people so well, you'll be pleased to know there is a Wolf Society, International Wolf Society. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> you, I am pleased you to can, know that. You can join. You can okay. join. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. A website of her own. Ah, ah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody want to sum up? We're coming up on an hour. Uh, any questions you have that no one's addressed? Um, any any final final conclusions? You know, the hope with this was that it would expand your appreciation of Austin. Two I things: think you did one, a great introduce nice job. you to another writer. Lovely. You did yeah, a lovely was... job, Polly. I'm very pleased. Thank okay, you so good. much. Okay, good. Definitely Thank you. Does that. Idea. I mean, I offhand at least can't think of anybody else who has the gift for dialogue that Jane Austen had. Yeah. Certainly Wolf does not have it. And I think <laughs> you said you didn't know if Wolf would be remembered. And I think that's part of it. I mean, we can relate more to Jane and Wolf is a little, I don't know what the word is. I can't, it's not coming to mind. It's not that if she's obscure, it's just, it's like, going to spend all these pages reading about the preparations for a dinner party is not i don't think as relatable <laughs> to people uh, austin's prose is more straightforward yes um, uh, austin certainly writes skillful sentences um but she's not she she's uh, I think flowery might be an appropriate 
description of of wolf's prose yeah um and it's 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 more of an acquired taste than than Definitely. austin's more straightforward concise direct prose i mean she's she really ta-nehisi coates um uh published some blog posts a while back about about what a great writer austin is what he learned about writing from from reading her i mean she really she really is still relevant you you can still learn a lot about how to write well from reading austin And Ta-Nehisi Coates is a wonderful writer. So yes, he is. <laughs> if he, he learned from is. Jane, then yeah. that's that's great. Yeah, I didn't know that. All right. Any other comments from anyone else before we sign off today? All right. Well, Holly, thank you so very much for facilitating this for us today. You really you are did so a welcome. fantastic job. You always do so much research and prep and it's always very insightful. So thank you so very much, Holly.